Joshua. Chapter number 1. I'm going to begin reading verse number 1. The Bible says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all thy days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou may, uh, mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now from verse number 2, all the way down to the end of verse number 9, that's what God said to Joshua. Moses is dead. Now, granted, that's got to take a big toll on Joshua. This is the man that's been his mentor. Right, for lack of a better term, even though I don't like the term, could have been his idol in the faith. He looked up to Moses. He aspired to Moses. Moses got to go up on a mountain where the presence of God was so strong even the animals wouldn't go on the mountain. He saw the very finger of God write the first tablets for the Ten Commandments. Right? I mean, how many times did... In fact, you know, it was said of Moses that never was there a prophet like Moses because he talked to God face to face. Many times God would come down in that pillar of cloud and at some point God revealed it to Moses because Moses wrote it down in the first five books of the Bible. But at some point God said, Hey, Moses, you know that in that cloud... I was this far away from you. I was talking to you face to face. Right? Josh, while all that's happening, Joshua's inside the tabernacle laying on his face praying unto God. He's got fear and reverence for God so much, he just hit the deck and started praying. He said, I don't know what's going on out there, but I know I'm not worthy of it. And now the one that's led him for 40 years, the one that's taught him for 40 years, Moses would go out and he'd teach the people what God commanded him but then he turned to Joshua and said now Joshua here's why that's important here's how you do this here's how you do that Moses knew that Joshua was going to lead Israel I don't know that Joshua knew but on this day Joshua found out not from Moses not from a vote of the collection of people right God spoke to Joshua used to God spoke to Moses now God spoke to Joshua and God told Joshua you're the one that's going to lead the people over Jordan he didn't just say that. He said, hey, get up and go over. He said, now, time's ready. Let's go. But in these verses, these nine verses, first, he gets a lot of promises. God promises him, first, that everything that he did for Moses, he would do for him. The instruction, right, the guidance that Moses got. You do realize that Moses was a leader that really didn't know how to lead. Everything he did, God told him to do. And really, what was he before? He was a shepherd. But not a shepherd of his own flock, a shepherd of his father-in-law's flock. So really, what's the shepherd do? The one that Whatever the one that owns the flock tells him to do. Moses knew how to take care of sheep, but he wasn't the one deciding where he was going with the sheep. That was his father-in-law's decision. Hey, take my sheep over there. Hey, next month, how about you go over there? I've heard there's green grass over that direction. Well, what's he do once he starts leading Israel? God says, hey, why don't you take my people over here? Hey, why don't you take my people over there? For 40 years, they stayed in the same wilderness. I've seen the size of it. It takes, it takes a lot to get lost for 40 years in the wilderness. But see, God, made, they didn't, God didn't make them lost. They made themselves lost. Because they didn't receive the report of the two spies that came back and said, 
I don't care how big they are. I don't care how big the food is. I don't care if it is flowing with milk and honey. God said it's ours. Let's go take it. They doubted. They had fear. They said, wait, well, there's giants in the land. Yeah, well, wasn't a problem for David. Granted, David hadn't even been born yet. But I believe Joshua and Caleb had faith like that. Who cares about the giants? We got God. We got Jehovah. Right, did y'all see that storm that he sent on top of that mountain when he was just talking to Moses? Imagine what he can do when he's angry at somebody. Right, they didn't think it was going to be a problem, but not everybody believed him. But he received the promise. Just like I was to Moses, that's how I'm going to be to you. But that doesn't mean that everything was going to be sunshine and rosy. Did not Moses disobey God when he smote the rock? And what was Moses' you know, payment for that disobedience? Well, he didn't get to see the promised land. Joshua was reminded that the only reason I'm in charge right now is because Moses didn't do what God said. He did more than what God said. Now, to his credit, I don't find that Moses ever did less than what God told him to do, but sometimes doing more is just as much of a problem. So Joshua, when he hears, I'll be to you just like I was to Moses, that means that I'm just as accountable as Moses. I don't get any free rides. It's all on my shoulders now. If I fail, God's people may fail. God's people may fail because I did too much or too little. So not only does he receive the promise that God's going to be with him, he said, I'll be with you whithersoever thou goest. I think he said twice. He said, he said, I promise, wherever you go, I'll be with you. And he promises that no man will be able to stand before him. That's referring to their enemies. God's saying, I've already fought the battle. You've just got to go and do it. They find out a little bit about that when they get to Jericho. Then they face Ai. That's a whole different story. We'll get there in a few minutes. But he promises, I'm going to be there every step of the way. He promises that if he studies the law that God gave to Moses and that Moses gave to God's people, that if its words shall always be in his mouth, that he'll prosper. That he'll do right according to the eyes of the Lord. That God will bless him for being obedient. Later, Samuel goes on to say, obedience is greater than sacrifice. It's better just do what you're supposed to do all along than try and make up for it later. There's not a sacrifice strong enough that can make up for disobedience. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But even more than that, disobedience is as the you know, sin of rebellion. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Very, very sobering thought, but I don't know what's going through Joshua's mind as he's hearing all this. But I do know the thing that God told him the most. Because he said it three times in nine verses. He said, be thou strong. And then he changes it up a little bit each time. But he says, and courageous. Or take courage. Be of good courage. Right, well, what's that word courage mean? I mean, we think we know what courage means. But courage means... By definition, some will say bravery. Some will say vitality, that you know you can stand up even when you don't feel like it. Right? But really what courage is, is it allows you to stand when all hope is lost. But Webster says that it's the thing that allows you to overcome the most desperate odds. He says, or keep good spirits in a time of you know, great sorrow... Or he goes on to say that you can keep good spirits when others are in a state of depression. Courage is a product of faith. You cannot have courage without faith. Because courage is acting on your faith. Courage doesn't always make sense to the outward man. Right? Those tales of great bravery that we have from wars or conflicts that have taken you know, place on American soil or other places. The reason that some men are courageous, it doesn't mean anything negative to those that are around them. One man was able to overcome. But if I was in their shoes, I can't say I wouldn't do the same thing as the guys that were hunkering down in the foxhole. Right? One man was able to overcome it, but I don't fault those that 
didn't take up the in fact usually all it takes is one person then that rallies everybody else but it gets your focus off of where you are and instead it's what can we do today maybe not for myself but for the guys that are in the rest of the company right for the rest of the army okay what can i do today for the kingdom of heaven what can i lay up as a treasure today that's that's greater than me right but courage is a product of faith if you don't believe what you've said or if you don't believe in where you're you've been placed you're not going to have courage you don't think it's worth fighting for I mean, jesus said that where a man's heart is or where his treasure is that's where his heart would be also if you don't value where you're at you're not going to give your all for it because you might be there in body but you're not there in spirit you're not going to have the gumption to get up and go because you don't want to be there in the first place you want to head back you don't want to press forward right courage is a product of faith because not only if you don't believe in where you are if you don't believe in who's leading you you're not going to follow they could say well hey let's get up and go but just because somebody says get up and go doesn't mean that you necessarily listen necessarily believe you know why stonewall jackson had the name stonewall jackson because unlike other generals who would sit up on a hill somewhere with a magnifying glass or binoculars he would stand on his horse next to his soldiers as they were fighting do you know why he did that because he just believed god so much that he said i can be in the midst of whatever battle i'm not going until god wants me to go and they said that in the face of great fire in the face of you know enemies rushing him he just stood there as a stone wall that's why they called him stonewall jackson but if you'd asked him well why do you do that well one he wanted to be there for his men those aren't somebody else's men those were his men so if they were going into battle he was going into battle he was accountable for them he believed in where he was he said this is where god wants me to be nobody can take me off of this place except god and that encouraged those around him robert e lee said that when stonewall jackson died that's when the south lost the civil war because he inspired others that much why because of his faith other people believe if he's here it's because he knows this is where we need to be so those that followed him said if he's here that means that we have to be here his resolve in the face of great adversity inspired those around him so joshua understands that i have to have courage because i may be the one to inspire the rest of israel god didn't speak to israel god spoke joshua joshua had to take the words of god back to israel and convey them in such a manner that they believed that he was saying what he that he believed what he was saying he wasn't making it up he wasn't flying by the seat of his pants he was doing what god wanted him to do because if he didn't have courage israel wouldn't have followed him they barely followed moses and he was the one that did 10 miracles in egypt he was the one that stood and said sand and see the salvation of the lord and then the red sea parted they all saw that but some of them still didn't follow when he came down with the first set of ten commandments what happened well they's carrying on in a you know for lack of a better term a whole bunch of foolishness idolatry worship they rose up to play right? a lot of implications there but he gets so angry he wants to kill him after he's convinced god not to kill him he's begging with god lord don't wipe it. what would they say about you if you let your people out and then he gets down and he wants to kill him now that's that famous passage of scripture where he moses stands up and says who's on the lord's side and those that weren't they got taken out the levites went from one side of the camp to the other side of the camp and nobody was left that wasn't on god's side i mean they had just seen what god did but they feared not out of reverence they said we don't want that god that god's too strong for us we can't control that god even those that saw the miracles that he had just done out of love for them he heard their cries in captivity and sent one to lead them out of captivity to the land that he promised to their fathers they should have been happy but see they didn't have courage they didn't want to follow they wanted to be in control it's like courage is a product of faith if you don't believe in what you're doing and where you're at 
in who you are following, you will not have courage when it comes time to have courage. The other thing about courage is you can't have courage when it's easy. Courage, by definition, can only be shown in hardness. Because if everybody's on board, that's not courage. That's following a trumpet, right? A charge. But trumpet means charge, so let's just charge. When nobody's charging, but you're the only one that got up to go and charge, that's courage. When nobody's left standing, but you just decide that I'm going to do all that I can to stand, and stand therefore as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what comes. If I need to make up the hedge, if I need to stand in the gap, I'll do it. That's courage. But if it's not a time of adversity, it's not courage. There has to be hardness in order to take courage. So, God told Joshua three times. Take courage. Be courageous. Be strong and of good courage. So don't you think Joshua had figured out that he needed a little bit of courage? For God to say it once would have been enough. He said three times. And really not nine verses. He didn't start saying it until verse number six. So between six and nine, he says it three times. Be strong and of good courage. So with the Lord's help this morning, we're going to teach you on courageous Christians. Anybody in disagreement that it's hard out there? That time's running out? It's worse than ever? That something needs to get done for the work of the Lord? That we should be doing more now than it's ever been done before? But yet it seems, doesn't necessarily always mean, I mean, God looks on the inward man. We look on the outward man. I don't know what God's doing in people's lives. right? But it's real easy to look around and get discouraged and say, well, not much is going on. God just says, be strong and of good courage. Doesn't matter what you see going on around. It matters what God's doing in here. If He tells you to go, go. If He tells you to stay, stay. If He tells you to take, take. If He tells you to reinforce reinforce but as he's telling you to do all of it he says be strong and of good courage courageous Christians are the ones that had their names added to the holy book of God as in samples as the book of Hebrews would tell us examples of those that one didn't have a completed word of God two didn't have the indwelling spirit of the Holy Ghost and yet some of them Noah heard from God once Noah said Noah was doing whatever Noah was doing one day and God said hey build an ark here's the dimensions make it out of this here's how you put it together and then for over a hundred years Noah didn't hear from God again he didn't have the Holy Ghost like we do to have that friend to stick it closer than a brother that he'd never leave us nor forsake us that we were we are the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost that he indwells us I am his he is mine I am in him he is in me Noah didn't have that. Noah just had one conversation. And everybody in the whole neighborhood knew that Noah was building an ark because God told him to. They thought he was crazy, most of them. They didn't think it was going to happen because they didn't know what rain was. Noah didn't know what rain was. But God knew what rain was, and that was enough for Noah. Against all the ridicule, he was strong and of good courage. But Moses had a whole lot of excuses on why God couldn't use him to lead God's people out. Lord, I don't talk very well. I murdered a man in Egypt. They're going to have my head if I come back. And he didn't do it righteous. He did it because he saw the way that he was treating his kinsmen and he didn't like it too much. And thought he got away with it until another Hebrew said, weren't you the one who killed the Egyptian the other day? How are you going to tell me what to do? All this going on in Moses' head and God says, I'll take care of it. Just go. It took a little convincing. But Moses went up and he went. Back to the place that he didn't want to go to. Back to the very man that he didn't want to stand in front of. To say something that really he's, he's a little afraid to say. Moses was raised in Pharaoh's household. 
He knew how Pharaoh thought of those that spoke poorly about the gods of Egypt. And Moses is going to show up ten times and ten times refute one of the major gods that the Egyptians had. But through it all, guess how much Aaron talked? None. Because along the way, Moses believed, really bought in, and he was strong and had good courage. Right? Even though they weren't perfect. Right? Samson. He believed God. Problem was, is that he just trusted a woman. Up until then... He was strong and of good courage. Even afterwards, he perceived not that the Lord had left him. He still believed that God was with him. That's why he went out to face the Philistines. Right? He didn't perceive that something had changed. Now, I've said all along, Samson was doing what Samson was supposed to do, which is be a judge over Israel. He would never been down there. Never would have been in the situation. But every time that Israel needed him, what do you find him do? Charging him taking up the gates of a city and walking off with them. Right? Even if he didn't have a weapon, he'd take the jawbone of a donkey and go out and slay a thousand Philistines. Right? Men like Benaiah. David dies. Benaiah is his king of his, or he's the captain of the king's guard. Right? He was the one that was in charge of the king's safety. Well, what's he do now? He goes to the one that David appointed. There was a little disagreement over that. You know who said it straight? Well, one, God, but then two, Benaiah. He's got other generals that say, hey, Solomon's not going to be king. He's got other princes saying, I'm the one that's taking the claim to the throne, and I've got all these people supporting me. And Benaiah said, I'm just going to do what my king told me to do and protect the new king. God worked it all out in the end. But against a whole nation that was saying, we don't want Solomon as our king. Benaiah said, God said it. Well, he said, God's man said it. That's good enough for me. He was strong and had courage. And we can go on and on about those people that overcame out. There was nothing special about them. They're made of the same stuff we're made of. So if they were given as our end samples, and they didn't have all the blessings that we have today, I can go back and read about it. If somebody in my town didn't know the story of Benea or didn't know the story of Solomon or didn't know the story of Samuel, David, I was out of luck because they didn't have this. For the most part, it was passed down by oral tradition. But once a week on the Sabbath, they'd go to the house of God and a man would get up and teach a portion of the Scriptures. But what if they're copy of Joshua had been used so much that it was damaged that they wrote off and sent off to have the next copy sent to them well they had to write it by hand and they checked it in triplicate you could go a very long time between having one wear out and getting a new one yet today I'm afforded the privilege of having it all at my fingertips and if I'm honest I've got more than this copy I've got one with notes in it I've got one that's got all the cross references from a studying got the one that he used to preach out of got this one now right? very blessed but that's all the more reason to take courage yet I don't find we got many people facing giants anymore I don't find that we've got those that say God said to cross the Jordan River and they're standing on the bank and they're waiting for God to part the Jordan River like he did the Red Sea Joshua said, no, you got to walk first, and then God will part it. Well, yeah, that really makes sense. Well, we're supposed to walk across on dry. If I step out and it's wet, it's not dry. Joshua said, just do it. So they took the ark over, and as soon as they committed their foot to the water, you know what I believe, Brother Rocky? They had to put their foot in the water for the water to start parting. It wasn't one of them, but if I do this, then the water starts to part. Now, they had to be on their way down before God parted it. And then halfway across, Joshua starts building a monument there in the middle of the Jordan River. You know why? So that you could see it once the water went back to prove that somebody walked all the way out there. I mean, I think we taught on that one time. Imagine building a rock pile in the middle of moving water. Not going to happen. The fact that it was out there was to give others courage. 
fact, he set up those mighty, and he tells them, just a few chapters after this, bring your children back to this place, point to it, and remind them what God did. Why? To, have, to encourage them to be strong and of good courage. But we find that God tells this to Joshua one more time. It's in chapter number 8, where I told you we'd be headed. He tells them three times in chapter number 1, and then for six chapters, everything's good. Then chapter 7 hits. It's right after Jericho. God did something else miraculous. Right? I'm, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I don't know how the walls fell, but they didn't fall into like big piles of rubble. You can still fight behind a pile of rubble. And a pile of rubble isn't flat. God said that they fell flat. Well, if a wall tips over, that's not, it may be flat, but it's not flat on the ground. I can't walk over that. The Bible says they walked over. What do you think? I don't know, but they walked across and it was flat. However, God did it. Granted, they had to walk around the city 13 times. Seven times on the last day. They're doing it and they don't have a weapon in their hand. They got trumpets in their hands. They're doing it and they're not ready to take the city they're walking around the city they're exhausted yet God caused everything to work out you would think that in that situation you'd have more reason to trust God than you did the day before but, you know, I can get it I'm human too day six after I've had to walk around the city I'm not going to be in the best mood by lap number six on day seven I'm probably in a very bad mood but yet Joshua just kept walking. And he told everybody else by his walking that he believed God was going to do something by the time they was done. I mean, he only saw the angel of the Lord. That's Jesus in the Old Testament. Met him and said, whose side are you on? Ours or theirs? He said, neither. I'm on God's side. He said, good enough for me. Joshua's got courage, and they follow. They have courage because of his courage. But then one person had to go and spoil everything. Wasn't Joshua. Wasn't the high priest. Wasn't one of the Levites. It was Achan. Now why did Achan take that which gold, the silver, and the Babylonian garment? Granted, we've already said, everybody that made it this far, they was on the Lord's side. They were raised for 40 years. They were either born in the wilderness or they were under the age that God gave us the cutoff. For 40 years, they lived off of God's grace and mercy. When they needed water, God caused water to come out of the rock. When the water was bitter, He made the water sweet. Every time that somebody came to overthrow them, God would cause them to be, you know, not only victorious, He'd wipe them out. They saw when an army that didn't have a chance as long as Moses' arms were in the air they prevailed they were slaves for 400 years they didn't know how to fight they knew how to build they knew how to labor they knew what harsh taskmasters were they didn't know what generals were they didn't know what marching formations were there's a whole bunch of people that didn't know what they was doing going against a whole bunch of people that didn't know what they was doing but yet God calls them to be victorious you would think that those people, they'd have courage. They'd know God's going to take care of it all. Keep also in mind, when they left Egypt, they took all the gold, all the livestock, everything that Egypt had with them. They weren't going hungry. In fact, they had more than they knew what to do with. And God didn't just feed them, He fed all that livestock. They didn't eat the livestock, obviously because they were complaining that they didn't have meat to eat with the manna so God sent them quails they saving the livestock for when they got to the promised land it's not like they needed gold or they needed silver or they needed Babylonian garments so why did Achan do it? because Achan didn't have courage he was trying to take a little nest egg so to speak who was he going to trade it to? None of the Israelites would have taken it. It was, a, it was the cursed thing. 
What's he going to use that gold with the little whatever stamp it had on it? It wasn't the one that the Israelites had used. What in the world were they going to do with it? How was he going to use it? Who's he, what's he going to buy from anybody? They're not making anything. They're living off of God's grace. Later we find their clothes didn't wear it. They're still wearing the same thing that they started off with. What's he need to buy? But yet he wanted that nest egg. In case something goes bad. Maybe I'll be able to barter this with the enemy that overthrows us. Maybe I'll be able to get me and my family out. Maybe if we meet some people that they want to join up with us, which happened on a few occasions in the book of Joshua. They said, because God's your God, we won't follow you. They said, we don't want to be a part of it, just we'll do whatever you say. They might have been able to barter with them because they didn't get the commandment not to touch the accursed thing. But for whatever reason, Achan did it. It's because he didn't have courage. You'd think 40 years plus, because I don't know how long it took to get from Jordan to Jericho and then Jericho to you know, pillage in the city. And there. I don't know how long it took. But for 40 plus years, he's not needed a thing, but now all of a sudden he thinks he needs it because he didn't have courage. But then, because of his disobedience, Joshua goes out to fight a battle against Ai and for the first time in 40 something years they lose and they didn't just you know okay guys good try we'll see you tomorrow no people died they lost and they come back and for 6 chapters Joshua's been strong he's had courage but look at chapter number 8 and the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be, neither be thou dismayed. For the fourth time now, Joshua hears, Don't fear. You know what be not dismayed means? Be of good courage. Dismayed is the opposite of courageous. He thinks he's done something wrong. He doesn't know that there's a, a cursed thing in the camp. God hadn't told him that yet. Okay? Okay? Well, no, he's, that was before. They come back from battle. This is all after they take care of Achan and everything else, chapter number 8. Chapter number 7 is where they go out and they take Achan and stone him and his whole family and everything that they own. Okay, they bury, and then they even named the place Achor to that day. You know why? As a reminder, a pillar. That's what happens when you don't obey what God says. Achan had to pay for the price of those other men's lives. He had to pay for it with his own blood. But see, Joshua comes back. They don't know why they lost. He thinks he's done something wrong. He thinks that he's let God down, that he's let God's people down. I can see it. In the back of his head, he's thinking, you know, maybe the devil's creeping up, putting thoughts in his head. Well, you're no Moses. Moses never lost. Yet it's been six and a half chapters and you've already gotten your butt kicked why don't you just head back over Jordan and go back to the wilderness but then on the other side he's got that part of his brain that's saying God said he promised to give it he said it's been the promised land since God promised it but it's about ready to be the received land he's saying God said he'd always be with us so why wasn't he with us something changed and it wasn't God that changed what changed then the other side of his brain saying, well, you changed. He doesn't know what's going on. Then God says, I didn't go with you because there's an accursed thing in the camp. Now, I don't know. There's nothing written that Achan was close to Joshua. But in the wilderness for 40 years, you get to know everybody. They weren't unacquainted. Now, granted, estimates say that by the time they came out of Egypt there could have been as many as 6 million Jews well when you're in charge you know a little bit about everything he may not have known who Achan, he may have known Achan's family he may have known what tribe he's from because at the end of the day they's all related they's all the children of God well it came from 12 brothers that came from one that came from the one before that is all one family and he was in charge of God's people. I ask our pastor, if you're in charge, you want to get to know people because you're responsible for them. 
if God gives you the position of an under shepherd, you want to be accountable for him. In fact, that's why the Bible says that we should give him even more honor and he's worthy of double honor because he watches for our souls. He cares about us more times sometimes than we even care about ourselves. Not to mention how much God cares for us and gives us someone to be the mouthpiece of God so that God can tell us well, we're too ignorant to get in the Word of God to find out ourselves. Or we're too stubborn to listen, so He gives a preacher a message that cuts us to the heart. That's not an easy thing to do, but the pastor does it because he watches for his... He loves you. Well, Joshua loved God's people. I believe he knew who Achan was. God put him in charge. He felt the burden, and he wanted to know the people that he was leading. I believe that. May not have been best friends with him, but he knew who Achan was. And he finds out that Achan did the one thing that God said not to do. I think it broke his heart. He knows where Achan's been because he's been there too. He's seen everything that Achan's seen. There wasn't anything that Achan experienced that Joshua didn't experience. And Joshua can't wrap his head around how somebody else can see everything that he just saw and then not have the faith that Joshua had. Not had the courage that Joshua had. And then he starts wondering, well, how many other people are like that? Then he starts wondering, well, what can I do to give them more faith? He couldn't do anything. God gives every man a measure of faith, but it's up to that man to use it and exercise it and get it stronger. Only thing he could do was what God told him to do. Fear not and be of good courage. To be strong and of good courage to be an example on how to use that faith. But until God, in chapter number 8, says, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Joshua was wondering the whole time, was it something I did? Did I make a misstep? What did I do that gave Achan the impression that it is okay to go in there and take that Babylonian garment? wasn't anything that Joshua did wrong. Achan just didn't believe God the same way that Joshua believed God. And that everybody else, because he's the only one that did it. Everybody else believed that if they took it, they was going to have to pay the price. Achan thought he could hide it under the rug. See, the thing about being courageous, it's not just doing it in overwhelming odds. If there's somebody else being courageous, it's easy for that to inspire in you courage. When you know you're not alone, it's easier to stand. But see, when you understand that you're never alone, because he's always with us, then it's easy to stand. Joshua had that nailed that. God said he's going to be with us. Wherever we go, he's with us. He's going to establish our footsteps. As long as we do his law, he's going to cause us not to just, you know, survive. He'll prosper us. He'll bless us. But see, sometimes it's hard being courageous when the people that are standing next to you desert. For the first time, Joshua had to deal with a situation where somebody didn't do what God said since he's been leader. He thought that problem got nipped in the bud way back when. When they said, who's on the Lord's side? Joshua thought they was all on the Lord's side. Through it all, yeah, he was one of the spies. He got sent into Canaan land. He knew how great it was. He got a taste of it, and for 40 years, he wanted to get back to where God sent him the first time. He's trying to tell her, you don't know how great it's going to be over there. Now they're there. God's starting to give it to them. And then somebody says, well, I don't want what God wants. You ever been in the fight with somebody? And the next thing you know, they cut out. Don't know where they went. Don't know what happened to them. Later you find out that maybe they stabbed you in the back. Maybe they did you wrong. Or maybe you're just having to do their job because they left a hole in the wall. They tore down the hedge in order to get out. Now you're stuck fixing it. Courage starts to wane when you start thinking about people and what's gone wrong and all the ways that things couldn't work out. Joshua didn't have time to think about all that. Right now he's saying, well, we know there's no way we can whip AI now. What does God say? 
Verse number one. Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai. God says, as long as you do what I say, and they know that now, doesn't matter who you stand against. I've delivered the king and all the people and all the land and everything they got into your hand. Joshua didn't have time to think of what what if this person does that or what if this person does that. Too many possibilities. Millions of people. A whole bunch of things can go wrong. There's only one way it can go right. Did not the apostle say that he told us those things to stir up by way of remembrance? That we should stir up in ourselves a pure mind? What's that? There's a whole bunch of ways it can go wrong. One way it can go right. I will think on those things. If there's anything good, if there's anything pure, of good report, think on those things. Why? Because thinking on the negative things only gives you more reasons to get out. Thinking on the good things, that'll bring courage. I don't care who's in the White House. I don't care who's in Congress. I know what the Bible says. No man comes to power unless God allows it. I also know doesn't matter what man does if God wants something different to happen it's going to happen I'm also not ignorant enough to think that in order to get to the end of the book it's got to get worse than it is right now but I also believe that God promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us I believe that God meant it when he said that he's never seen the righteous forsaken I believe that everything that he wrote down all the promises I believe that he renews those every day to me not in general but he makes them to you and then to me just like they were always intended for me because they were because God loved us with an everlasting love if we think on those things it's easier to have courage but just because you believe doesn't mean you're going to act on it some people believe but they also believe that the world will do to them something or they'll lose something or they'll have to give this up or they'll have to forsake so and so well maybe but if it's what God wants why wouldn't you I just don't get that my brain doesn't function that way but those people that have that stupid bumper sticker God said it I believe it that sells it hogwash God said it that's enough should, bumper sticker should stop at God said it he said, let there, and then there was light, and there's a whole bunch of plants, and there's a whole bunch of fish, and a whole bunch of animals, and everything. He breathed in a man the breath of life. If God says it, it's enough. In fact, he said, heaven and earth shall pass away. His word shall not pass away. You know why? Because he said it, and that's what caused everything to be. The very word of God is the only thing that will be for forever besides God. Why do you think that Jesus was the word? That's, that's a study I don't have time to get into. He said his word shall not pass away, but yet the word was made flesh and dwelt among men. Right in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Right? You start thinking about the reason that at Armageddon he opens his mouth and a sharp two-edged sword comes out. It's because it's the word of God. Right? That is the one that we're the joint heir to. So if the word can never pass away, we can never pass away. No matter what happens to me here, you can take this. It's already settled. There's a half that hadn't been told, but it's already written. That's good enough for me. I don't need to know what it says. It's not going to pass away because it's the Word of God. My conversation's already recorded there. I'm all, Literally, the only thing keeping me from getting there is the fact that I'm still breathing. When God wants that not to be the case, it, I won't be breathing no more. I'll be there. He's already got spot for me. He's already got apparel picked out for me. Right? And then if I get there before the rapture, the only thing I'll be waiting on is that new body because i got to wait for this one to get called up so that it can be turned into one like his. It's all settled in God's eyes, so why is it in debate in our eyes? We think about how much God really does mean what He says. Why wouldn't we do it? 
God was just as serious with Achan as He is with us in our day. Only I don't get where Joshua is going to judge me. I'll have to stand before the Lord and He'll judge me. Not for sin. I was judged for sin at Calvary, but I'll be judged whether the deeds that I did in this body after I got saved were good or evil. The works of my life will be put through the fire of God. That's why the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. His righteousness won't let anything that isn't pure get close to Him. My works will be put up before God and we'll see what stuck. What was gold, silver, and precious gems and what was wood, hay, and stubble. And then, I'll either be rejoicing because what I did lay up was seen as precious in the eyes of God or I'll be weeping because I know that I could have done... In fact, I believe every single one of us be weeping after we see all of our works go through because we realize how much more we could have done. How much more I could have been like Him. How much more I could have submitted to Him. We'll all walk away the great white throne of judgment with... Or walk away from the judgment seat of Christ with tears in our eyes. Because we'll see how much He loved us and how much more we could have loved Him. Because even if you do everything you can because of sin and because of His flesh, you can't do all. He did all. They didn't need somebody else to come behind Him and to finish things up. He said, it is finished. and been done. Completed. Didn't need anything else. But I can't do all. I may desire to, but I can't. There'll be things that I wish never did, wish I could take back. But today, I can be strong and of good courage. Today, I can do what He desires me to do. And if I stand today, standing tomorrow is a little bit easier. I'm already there. It's harder to do something different than it is to keep doing what you've already been doing. Doesn't matter how hard life gets, if you've just been strong and of good courage, it's easier to stay of strong and good courage than it is to get out of the fight. If you're on the front line, it takes a little bit of work in order to get out of the army. You got to go past some people. And if they love you like Christ told them to love you, they'll want to bear your burdens. They'll say, hey, you can get off the front line, but stay here. We want to help you. You may try to get out, but you're going to have to get a whole lot of people that are going to want to help you stay in because you are knitly framed together. If I'm strong and of good courage, if the rest of the church is of strong and good courage, in order to get out, I've got to go past a whole lot of people that are going to want to help me, that love me. I'm going to have to walk out on people that have prayed for me. I have to look them all in the face. Well, it's a whole lot easier to get out if nobody's being courageous. But if you taking a stand is what it takes for somebody else to realize that it's worth going the extra mile, that it's worth sticking in the fight. You say, well, how do I know who that... We may not know. But I know my life is a written epistle known and read of all men. I may never have the conversation with the person. Just the fact that I keep coming back, that I keep standing, that I get up and saying praising God how good God's been to me that may be enough but I do know that if you get out if you stop being courageous the gates of hell can't prevail against the church but the church won't be gaining any ground out there we can be nice and safe and tight you know cozy in our little bubble here but we'll have to look out the window and realize that we didn't do much out there you can pull the wool over your eyes like Achan did. Think, well, I don't have to be strong and courageous today. Or you can be like Joshua. You never find after chapter number 8 that God ever tells Joshua again, fear not, or be of good courage. He realized he couldn't control other people. He could look at what other people were doing, but all that was going to do is give, you know, give them more questions. And He said, I'm going to give them what God gives me, and I'm going to live like I believe it. And you find that from that day forward, he did. You find that from that day forward, Joshua, whether he realized it or not, led God's people because he just pays, paved the way. He went first. He said, God, God said, get over here. And then he turned around and he started walking. They realized, well, if we want to get where God wants us to be, we've got to go follow. He was an example, but he also was a partaker. He got all the riches that 
Israel got. He had a whole lot more burdens, but he's the one that got to divvy. Hey, Benjamin, tribe of Benjamin, God promised that to you, so go and take it. Hey, Judah, God promised you that, go and get it. He was the one that divvied up the spoils. He got to see behind the scenes all that God really did give to people. Right? And at the end of it, he got to go out almost like Moses did. Except Moses, he didn't get to see the promised land. Joshua did. But it's said of Joshua that he was a great leader of God's... In fact, today, you go to West Point, they study some of the battles that Joshua fought because they say that it was great military tactics. I don't think so. I think Joshua was just a boy that used to be a slave that God turned into a general. I don't think there's anything special about Joshua. I think there's something special about Jehovah. But you know why Joshua got the credit? Because he was strong and of good courage. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.